Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I've got another product review for you guys. We'll be taking a look at this a KC901V network analyzer. Now, I had never seen one of these before. You probably have not seen one of these before, neither. But the vendor contacted me, asked me if I want to review this, and I said, well, absolutely. Network analyzers are always welcome here at the Signal Path. Now, this particular unit is pretty interesting. It's low cost. It's about $2,000. And again, for a 9 kilohertz to 6.8 gigahertz network analyzer, it's uh, fairly reasonably priced. Now, it depends on its performance performance and how it works. We're going to take an extensive look at that. Now this is, even though it's a two-port network analyzer, uh, you can do S21 and S11 measurement on this. These are the only two S parameters that you can measure on this unit. But it also can act as a spectrum analyzer as well as a synthesizer. It has a low frequency output uh, that goes you know, close to zero hertz. So it's really pretty interesting. It has Ethernet, um, SD card, USB standard, everything on it. And uh, it's pretty nice I would say. Now you're going to see uh, my full review of it of course and then you can judge for yourself but let's go ahead on their website take a quick look and see uh, what it looks like uh, on their uh, product offering page as well as the uh, block diagram and I'm going to do a full teardown of this and then of course we're going to do experiments on it. So let's get started. And here we are on the Deep Ace website, just to show you the kind of products they have. They have a whole bunch of various antennas, which are actually quite broadband, uh, 730 megahertz to 6.5 gigahertz or 1.5 to 9 gigahertz wideband directional antennas. These will be pretty interesting uh, to play around with. I don't have any of these at the moment. What I do have is, of course, the KC901V, which is the high-end 6.8 gigahertz handheld network analyzer that they offer. They also have the KC901S, which is a lower frequency uh, with some other limitations. They also offer a type N 6 gigahertz calibration kit, but I already have my own calibration kit, so we don't have to get this. It's nice because this particular one is first of all is type N, so it mates directly with the instrument. Also, they have the calibration coefficients for it into the instrument. And there's also a 4 gigahertz power detector and a whole bunch of other things. I suggest that you go and look at that. Now, in order to really understand how we can use the KC901V and what are some of its limitations, we need to understand its block diagram and exactly how it's constructed. Now I've done some tutorials on network analyzers during one of my repairs, but I assume that you have a basic understanding on how a network analyzer actually works. So here's the block diagram of this particular unit. Now immediately when you look at this, you can see that this is not a complete two-port network analyzer because it doesn't have sufficient number of mixers and sufficient number of couplers. But this will still be able to give us S11 and S12 as this instrument is intended to do. So let's follow some of the signals and see what happens. So there's obviously going to be a local PLL which has to cover the entire range of the frequency uh, that the instrument is supposed to work on. And it has two a two-step conversion which is also pretty common so here's our first conversion mixer this is our high frequency mixers and then the output of this high frequency mixers are going to be down converted uh, with a carrier of 110 megahertz where the second mixer will be able to convert that back down to 350 kilohertz so we will expect to find another local oscillator and a pair of mixers there and then finally a, a second IF 350 kilohertz filter. Now this architecture is an architecture of a network analyzer not of a spectrum analyzer but nonetheless this unit will be able to give you spectrum analysis by using the network analysis function. So it's not going to be a complete spectrum analyzer and it's going to have some limitations and I will show you that when we are going to use it. Various filters and so on are also there. So this is going to be our, our path for down conversion in this direction. Now we also need signals to go in and out of the instrument so here there is another PLL. Now interestingly enough this PLL is listed to work from uh, 0 0.06 to 3 gigahertz, which is a little bit unusual. I would have expected this to also be going to 7 gigahertz, and in the teardown, I think it does. So I'm a little bit confused about why this says 3 gigahertz here. Perhaps there's a little something that I'm missing, but anyway. And there's also a DDS there to create a low frequency output because this thing can generate all the way down to 0 0.001 uh, megahertz signal, which is quite nice. And part of that signal then can go to the AF output, which is a low frequency output. And then a switch can then select uh, whether you are choosing from the DES or the PLL. And then there's a forward coupling. So that forward coupling will allow you to sample the signal on this mixer. And a switch then allows you to either pass the signal to port 2, so you can do S12 measurement, or you can pass it directly to port 1, so you can do S11 measurement. And then a reflected signal then comes back and goes into this mixer, which then combined with the calibration equation will give you the S parameters, the phase and the amplitude response of the signal. And then 
the signal of the IF is obviously has to be digitized and then goes through some digital processing and applications and so on. Not, nothing exciting from there. This is all digital at this point. So the block diagram is really straightforward and uh, it would be interesting now to take a look and see what the unit is actually internally constructed. Now, as with some of the other vendors, uh, these guys sent me the bare PCBs of the unit so I don't have to take apart the one that I'm reviewing. But they send me much more than that, and I was really surprised. Let me show you what they send me because it's really quite extraordinary. And here is everything that they've sent me. They've basically sent everything required to build the unit from scratch. And this is not just the two boards, the digital and the RF board, uh, and the case, of course. They have sent me the batteries, the LCD screen, every single uh, component required, the, the, the little keypad, the LCDs here, of course, the protective glass of the LCD, some foam pads, our EMI absorber pads, and every single cable uh, connector that is required to build a unit, <laughs> all individually labeled, by the way. And so someone has gone through the trouble of actually labeling all this for me, so I know exactly what's going on, down to the screws. They even have sent me the individual screws required. Uh, to put a complete unit together. So it would be interesting uh, if it's actually going to be worthwhile, I think it would be, uh, to build one just completely from these parts, almost like a kit, uh, and build your own <laughs> network analyzer. And of course, with the case, everything in, in being included, I don't see why it wouldn't, unless the boards don't work, which I would be very surprised if they don't use the, for example, the keyboard PCB, uh, which has uh, LEDs at the back of it. So very cool stuff. I'm very impressed by the dedication to really show how this thing is uh, manufactured. I mean, you don't really see uh, other people doing this. So this is really a new standard for sharing design uh, and construction of your product with the users. It's really great. And here is the RF board, and it looks really nice. It's a four-layer board, and it uses very nice components, as we shall see. And the design is uh, very nice and clean. The soldering job looks good. And again, if you saw this for the first time, you wouldn't be able to tell if this is not from, let's say, Keyside or Roden Schwartz at first glance. I really like the design here. So now, now that we've seen the block diagram, we should be able to at least get a good idea of what's going on here. And, and go from there. So uh, the very first thing to note is that there are four SMAs here. Out of the four SMAs, this one is terminated into 50 ohms permanently, and this one is port one, this one is port two, and this is the AF port, the low frequency port. So based on that, we can then trace out the signal path, no pun intended there. So over here at the bottom right corner, we have an analog devices DDS. This is a 400 mega sample per second, DDS that I think I've shown in a different uh, instrument somewhere else and this will provide the low frequency signals up to 50 megahertz or so and you can see that it goes through here and then can be applied directly to the AF port. At the same time there's a solid state switch here which allows this to be switched into port 2 and we saw that on the block diagram also so that takes care of the AF pad. Now if you look at here there's two identical components one over here and one over here. These are both analog devices, uh, 6.8 gigahertz full synthesizers, and they also have dividers output so they can provide uh, all the way down to very low frequencies with combinations of dividers and so on. And these have built-in VCO, so they're full synthesizers. Now, this is where the situation is a little different from the block diagram, because these are both identical 6.8 gigahertz uh, signal sources, even though the block diagram says 3 gigahertz, I think the block diagram is wrong because if the, if it was only a 3 gigahertz synthesizer, then none of the frequency planning would work and also you wouldn't be able to generate a up to 6.8 gigahertz directly from the ports and in this instrument you can. So I think that it's a mistake, but if not, please uh, you know comment in the section let me know. But anyway, so here's where the selection is happening. So this will therefore be our internal PLR for generating our stimulus signals. And that will then go over here. There's a step attenuator here. This is a digital attenuator, some amplification there. There's some coupler over here, some uh, signal being coupled into the mixer, and then going over here with the switch to the port two. Or you can select it from this switch and another attenuator again into port one. So that's how the PLL path finds its way to port two and finds its way to port one. At the same time, over here and over here are two linear technology mixers. These are all the way up to six or seven gigahertz mixers, I believe. And these guys are the main, the first down convert mixers of the instrument. And they are fed, of course, with the identical synthesizer so that this synthesizer and this synthesizer can work in conjunction to create the first IF. And then the conversion after that is handled by these two mini circuit mixers again. Now, it's an interesting to see here this uh, power splitter and uh, uh, combiner here that you can see, which obviously is responsible for getting the signal out of port one and getting the reflected signal back into 
another uh, mixer. So that takes care of that portion of the circuit. It's pretty straightforward. We got 209.65 megahertz crystals, and these are the LOs for the second mixers, the second down conversion stage, which is which is fed by these two. So it's all really uh, pretty clear. There's a couple more attenuators there, uh, some op amps which are on the final IF. It looks to me, if I'm not mistaken, that the bandpass filter is done in active domain. I'm not 100% sure, but by just looking at it on first glance, that's what it looks to me. There's some trimming here, perhaps for trimming the main uh, VCO for both of these synthesizers, the main reference perhaps. And that's so that you can adjust it, you know, to make sure it is actually at the frequency you want. Because this could be completely off in frequency. It will still work, but it just wouldn't give you the correct frequency when it is uh, doing measurements, especially in spectrum analysis. So, yeah, and then there's an interesting component here. It looks like a thin film directional coupler. Not really in the block diagram. At first I thought perhaps this is the directional coupler for the port 1. But then it's in the wrong place. It's uh, connected to the second mixers. Not quite sure, but it looks like to be a directional coupler. At least the only number that matched uh, this component was that. Some DC power stuff, nothing really fancy. You can see that this portion of the circuit is identical with this portion of the circuit. So this is part of this synthesizer and this is part of that synthesizer. Really nothing else on there that's interesting. So then the IF is uh, generated all the way out here. This is the end of the chain. Now if I were to flip that on this side, you can see a few more components there and uh, just a bunch of voltage regulators and the connector to the other board and an Altera Cyclone FPGA. Now, uh, if I look in here, I don't see any ADC. So I suspect that the ADC is implemented uh, using the FPGA. And that would be my guess. But I don't think the ADC is on the other board because I couldn't find it on the other board neither. So it's likely that it is done by this, and there's some analog switch actually here, which kind of further suggests that perhaps it is implemented in the FPGA. It's possible to do Delta Sigma ADCs in the FPGA. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, yeah, so looks very nice. Uh, I think I've covered everything that's on this board. Just give you a quick idea. Uh, ag again, the exact detail of how everything's connected. Yeah, you can go and reverse engineer it but not really necessary. The components kind of uh, tell you what's going on and they fairly match the block diagram fairly well. So in big, and none of the uh, marks have been rubbed off or anything, so you could replace anything you want. And these are all off-the-shelf components. So pretty happy with that. Now if I move on to the other board, if I can get it, this is the digital board. And the digital board has all the stuff that you would expect from this board. And uh, there's the uh, Ethernet controller over here, a whole bunch of power supply stuff there. This is our um, DC input. It's nicely fused there, as you can see. Here's a micro USB input, uh, Ethernet, and uh, the SD card reader is there. There's a couple of different ribbon connectors to connect to the LCD, to the rotary knob, the keyboard, and to the um, digital, to the RF board. And there's an interesting serial port here, so you could actually listen to see what's going on uh, with the serial board. This is a six layer board, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there's a six layer board. And uh, let me see what else I was going to say about it. There's obviously the batteries uh, going there. Here's uh, some more JTEC connectors for programming some of the components. Now, if I flip it on the other side, you can see that there is an ST microelectronics ARM processor on that side, some memory there. There's an FTDI chipset over here. There is a USB uh, controller over there really nothing else uh, that stands out and this is where the LCD would go. So really clean and straightforward design and you can see how easy it is, well easy, relatively easy, to make a network analyzer and of course it boils down to writing the software and getting everything to work together, doing a proper frequency planning and making sure the components uh, create good RF performance. So now that we've seen both of these guys, uh, we should be able to go ahead and take a look at the unit itself. All the other uh, components, they're really not that exciting to take a look at. For example, the keyboard, you know, there's nothing really exciting there, so I'm not going to waste my waste my time or your time. Going over it there, here's a, a little LCD screen. So I'm really eager to see if I can put this back together and have a second unit, but we'll find out uh, perhaps maybe towards the end of the video. But right now, let's go turn the unit on and see how it performs. All right, let's go ahead and do an S11 calibration so we can take a look at some experiments there. Now I've connected the cable to both of the ports, even though I don't really need both of them, I only need port one. And because I'm doing an S11 calibration, I only need to do an SOL standard, a short open and a load. And I have my calibration kit here, so we have our short open and load. I'm just gonna use these guys. 
Now, this particular calibration kit here is a pretty old one, and these the ones that I'm holding in my hand, they've really lost their metrology grade um, you know, characteristics, so I'm not worried too much. And But in general, you should really respect these components if you want to do a very high dynamic range calibration, as these are intended. So for our purposes, uh, if you see me you know, handle them not with the greatest care, uh, this is not the way you're supposed to be doing it. For the purposes of this experiment and for the purpose of testing this instrument, it doesn't really matter that much. Just keep that in mind and be very careful with calibration standards. These things are really, really expensive. So let's go ahead and try that. And I'm going to find a good way to focus on the screen without getting much reflection, and we can see the procedure. All right, let's go ahead and try and do a calibration. Now, first thing is to set the start and stop frequency. Let's do a you know full span calibration from the beginning to the end. So start frequency, we can start at 9 kilohertz, which is the lowest frequency there. And we're going to stop it all the way at, uh, actually, this goes up to 7 gigahertz. So let's go stop at 7 gigahertz. Where is the gigahertz? There it is. So now it's a really a full span from uh, 9 kilohertz to 7 gigahertz, full span of the instrument there. And you can see that it right now is set to user cal. I can set it to correction off, and this is with no correction at all being applied. There's also a system calibration, which is what it comes with at the factory. There's a bit of a ripple at the end of that because I have cables connected and a connector connected on it. But nonetheless, uh, we can start from here. So let's go back to user cal. Now keep in mind that I haven't actually entered the calibration data for the calibration kit. And you can enter that if you go under function, and there's a whole bunch of other settings you can change here. Uh, time, date, uh, the network setting, the brightness, uh, how long it takes for it to turn off, and the sweep point, how many points and the sweep speed can be set in here as well. And you can see the, uh, the calibration data at the bottom there. I'm going to leave it as default, uh, just doesn't really matter for our purposes. It's only important to know that it's there, that if you have it, if you really want to be very accurate, then you can enter the calibration uh, data there. You have to do this for any real, you know, proper S parameter calibration, but for our purposes, we can just leave it as default. So let's exit that. And uh, now that we, everything's ready, we can actually do a calibration. So let's do a recal. And it's going to ask, oh, do you want to continue? Yes, I do. And it's going to do a five second warm up, which kind of seems a little bit silly. I don't know what the point of that is. And uh, then connection port one, what are we looking for? It wants a short, okay, let me look, find the short one over here. So you can see that's a short, there it is. So we can connect that to port one and I'm connecting it right now. I won't bring it in front of the camera because it, the focus will have to change. Go okay. So it's gonna measure a couple of times probably and record the, re the data and then compare it to the ideal and, and eventually compute the calibration coefficients for the S parameters. And there's a really good paper on how that is actually done if you really wanna read about how these equations were initially developed. So now it's asking for an open. Here's the open, making, okay, oops. I did not wanna shift that. Let me go, let's put this back where it was. And now it's asking for a load. All right. This is what I was talking about, not having a kickstand. I just kind of makeshift something and it's slippery on the table. Uh, yeah, it would be so much better if it actually came with one. And here's the load as the final one. And the load is connected. I'm going to go OK. So now it's going to measure the load and it's going to complete the SOL and then compute all the parameters, upload everything, and then processing. And calibration is done. And there it is. And you can see that uh, we have all the way, right now it's measuring S11, and I'm terminating into a load right here. So that's why the S parameter S11 is you know, really low. And in fact, if you look up here, you can see that the markers are reporting minus 60, minus 70 dB. So it is a reasonably good calibration. If I remove the load, we should see S11 jump back to zero. And there it is. You can see that it jumps back to zero. It's not perfect, but it's, it's definitely good enough for what we want to do. So now that we've done this, let's measure something. And I have an antenna that I want to measure. Let's see if the antenna actually meets its specification and it is at the right frequency. So let's grab the antenna and try it out. And here is the antenna that I'm interested in measuring. Now, this is a really good antenna uh, from Huber and Sooner, and this is a from made in Switzerland. So this is a very famous company for making uh, these type of devices. This is a 2.4 to 2.43 gigahertz antenna, and it's a directional radiating from the back side here, and that's the input right there. So I'm going to measure its characteristic impedance. I want to measure its return loss and so on, see how good of an antenna it is at the frequency that it claims to be operating at. Now, remember that the return loss isn't 
necessarily a good measure of how well an antenna performs because you can match pretty much anything to 50 ohms. It doesn't mean it's going to radiate well. It doesn't mean it's going to have high efficiency and high gain. But uh, nonetheless, we, we can measure its return loss and find out if it's matched at the correct frequency. The matching, obviously, is very important. So let's go ahead and connect it and see what happens. And I'm going to just put it on the table like this so we can do a couple of quick experiments with it. So here we go. We can connect it to port 1 and there it is. We can see the S parameter being updated live there. I'm going to just leave it on the table there. And we can see that there is a, a dip at some point. So there's a notch in the S in the return loss. So let's zoom in a little bit and, and take a look and see uh, what, what it looks like. So let's go and move that marker to where the, the notch is and see how good the return loss is at that frequency. So right here, right now, the notch is sitting at 2.34 gigahertz is minus 24 dB, which is you know reasonably well matched, but it's not quite the right frequency yet. Now, now if I lift it off the table, you can see that the frequency shifts higher. So now if I if I can somehow use my other hand and rotate the knob to the right frequency, there you go, 2.4 gigahertz. And look at minus 28, minus 30 dB. So the table has an effect on the characteristic impedance of this antenna, and that's because the table isn't perfectly uh, uh, transparent to this to the frequency we're talking about. This table has moisture in it, it has a dielectric constant of its own, and there's some metal underneath it, so it's interfering with it. Now, if I were to put my hand in front of the antenna, I can also completely influence uh, its characteristic impedance. And remember, this is a near field because I'm really close to the antenna. So if I put a piece of metal in near field in front of this antenna, I can completely detune it. Check it out. There's a piece of metal in front of it, and it just completely disappears, it's not even tuned at the right frequency anymore. And this is normal. You obviously don't want to put a piece of metal in your field right in front of your directional antenna. It will ruin everything. So now that we have this, we can look at this data in multiple formats. And I really like the way this instrument handles this. In a, in a tiny screen, it gives you tons of information. So right now, uh, my marker is sitting, let's just say, with the table included. Uh, we're at about 2.3 uh, gigahertz or so. I can change the format of the data the way it's displayed. I can look at it, the impedance of the antenna directly. If I plot that, there it is. Right now it's plotting the magnitude of the impedance and I can change that from, let's say, the real part, the imaginary part, and the magnitude. And the marker at the top of the display is actually reporting uh, critical information. So you can see it's telling me the magnitude of the uh, resistance, but more importantly, the real part is 56 ohm, and the imaginary part is minus, uh, or it changes as I move my hand in front of it, about minus 2 or 3 ohms. So that's a very handy piece of information because it tells you how the characteristic impedance of the antenna is changing and what it actually is, which would then help you, of course, to match to it and modify it and change it. I can also look at it in several different ways. I can look at it in um, Smith chart, which is pretty handy, very classic, obviously, Smith chart displays. And this is a really good way to display it because look at all the information I'm getting. I have obviously my Smith chart there and the marker right there is very, very close to the number one over there, which is the 50 ohm uh, point there. And you can see that it gives me the marker, it gives me the, again, the real and imaginary impedance, it gives me an equivalent capacitance at that frequency right now, it's capacitive because the imaginary part is negative. So it's telling me, oh, you know, it's about minus 31 picofarad of capacitance you have at that point. This is, this is a very useful piece of information. Again, it gives you gamma. It gives you the angle. So hey, you have all the information you would need and you would get from, you know, as a, a state-of-the-art network analyst, this is as much information as they're going to be able to give you. And um, if I go, what else can I do here? I can also look at the phase. Uh, anyway, it's not that interesting in this case. But uh, nonetheless, you can get all that information directly uh, from the instrument. So S11, yeah, looks pretty good, pretty straightforward. And uh, now for S21, we're going to have to recalibrate again because remember, it's a different path. We need to do a proper frequency through calibration. So we're going to do that. And then we can measure a tunable filter. And we can look at the impedance of the tunable filter in series with a phase shifter. So that should be pretty interesting. So while we're at it, let's do a calibration for S21, and I'm going to go ahead and change the mode uh, from S11 to S21. And in S21, now I'm going to get obviously nothing because there's nothing connected between the two ports, and I can go ahead and do a recal. And yes, I do want to continue. And then it's going to do that same uh, strange warm-up thing that it's doing, and this time the seconds is in capital letters. Uh, please connect port 1 to port 2. No problem. I'm going to use a through, and I'm going to connect the two ports together. And there we go, connected, and let's say OK. Now it's going to do the same calibration. There's just a simple through calibration in this case, and calibration complete. There it is. And right now it's not running, so I'm going to go run, 
and obviously you're going to get a perfect through so there's no it's calibrated out the measurement plane is at the tip of the cables that I used and with the error of the connector in there because I haven't entered the, its exact length into the calibration data but it doesn't matter for our purposes it's just fine and if I disconnect it obviously you can see that it drops to minus 80 and right now there's nothing in between them so it's just sitting at the noise floor of the instrument at the moment uh, so now we can go ahead and connect our device under test to it so I'm going to prepare that and hook it up it should be pretty cool and here is our setup so I have a tunable filter here which is mechanical it's adjusted with this knob over here you can probably see there's a little display that shows you the exact frequency that you're supposed to be tuning it to and it's in series with this a DC to 8 gigahertz phase shifter. This is a mechanical phase shifter. I think I've shown the inside of one of these in one of my previous videos when I was talking about microwave components. It's nothing more than a U-shape wire here with a slider across it. So the total length of electrical length between here and here changes depending on the location of that uh, wiper that goes back and forth. And that's how it changes the delay. It's a true, it's a true delay a mechanical component. So we can use that to see if the phase shifter uh, actually influences the S parameters because it should. And then we can see also the response, uh, both in band and out of band, see how much rejection it has. So now we can go back to the screen. Right now I have it set to 1.5 gigahertz. So let's go back and see if it's actually doing what it's supposed to. And here it is. So let's go ahead and bring the marker back onto the peak here. So we can see if the peak is at the correct frequency and right there there you go 1.516 which is exactly what this is supposed to be set to and you can see that it has an insertion loss about about a db and that includes the cable connecting the phase shifter to the um, the filter as well as the phase shifter itself and of course the filter itself so it's not that bad you know it's fairly reasonable now i can click this and then move the other marker over and this will give us a delta and see let's say at what frequency are we let's say you know 30 or let's say 40 dB at uh, 40 dB below where we're supposed to be so there is the delta at the bottom right right around here it seems reasonable there we go because it's telling me all the measurements uh, live it's pretty easy to do this you can see at the top here I'm, I'm I'm at two different frequencies and it's telling me the absolute value of marker 1 and the delta from marker 2 so we have minus 41 uh, down from uh, minus 1, so we have a delta of minus 40, there it is, 39.96, so about 40 dB down, and the difference in frequency is a hundred, uh, about 100 megahertz, which means that at 100 megahertz outside of the band uh, of this filter, we are already 40 dB below, so it's a really good filter, really good mechanical filter, I mean it is enormous, so you would expect this to be a very good filter, multiple sections in there, you're going to get quite a good performance out of it, but nonetheless, you can very quickly measure and get an idea of what's going on. Now, I can switch back to S11, I can go under a mode, and I can go to S11, and I already have my old um, calibration because I've already done that calibration so now port 2 is not doing anything but port 1 is still measuring the return loss so you can see right where the S parameter was uh, the S21 was maximum S11 is at its minimum and that makes sense because all the energy is going through the filter and that's where it's matched to 50 ohms there's no reflection so you can go back and forth between the two S parameters and you will have the calibration and it will show you the, a good result there but also keep in mind here, look how flat the S11 is outside of the band. So it means that it's not matched to 50 ohms at all outside of its frequency of operation. That's also to be expected. Microwave filters will often do that. So now I can go back to S21 again and get my measurement back. Now let's go ahead and tune this away and let's check it out and see how it moves the S parameters around. There it is. You can see that it is moving across the frequency so let's go all the way to its maximum frequency and see if there is a difference in its insertion loss there it is it's about let me make sure it's settled down three gigahertz now look at the frequency response is quite different now uh, we have an interesting behavior here where it no longer goes down and stays and it comes right back up it's at the edge of its uh, frequency range so it doesn't work very well at the edge now let me go back a little bit we can see that the behavior changes again so let's operated at two and a half gigahertz not a very good filter at uh, at three but here we go let's uh, go back to the first marker and bring this marker over this should be around two and a half gigahertz and yep 
it's two and a half gigahertz so that seems about right and you know insertion loss is about the same didn't expect the insertion loss to change too much and it indeed doesn't uh, but you can see that other peak and if I move the marker to the other peak we see another section where we have uh, some transmission through the filter at 3.686 outside of the range of operation of this filter so you can get a very good idea of what exactly it is doing uh, by doing this so I'm really happy with the, the way this is instrument works and it also gives you the face and this is one other thing I wanted to show you so let me roll this back to let's say uh, let's go to 2 gigahertz that should be a fairly good uh, region there so let me bring the marker over here and let's put the marker around 2 gigahertz there it is the peak of the, the filter now I, let's take a look at its phase so now it's measuring the phase of the signal. Now it's, the phase is going to be just a mess outside of the range of the filter. But we, what we're interested in is looking at the phase of marker 1, which is at 2 gigahertz. That's the frequency of operation of the filter right now. Now I'm going to change the phase shifter, and you can have your eye on the phase. It's right now sitting at minus 70 degrees. Let's take a look. Change the phase shifter. If I can turn it by hand, there it is. Check it out. I can change the phase shifter and I can change the phase of the filter because I have a phase shifter in series with it and you can clearly see how the whole waveform is shifting continuously and I can go all the way to its minimum or its maximum value I'm not sure which direction I'm turning it there you go now 160 degrees and I can stop somewhere around here but remember this is just a phase shifter it doesn't change the magnitude of the response so if I go back and look at uh, the loss you can see that it's still sitting at 2 gigahertz so to change the phase here I'm rotating it right now you can see it has almost no defect but it does have a small effect because the loss look at the loss over here as I turn it the loss changes and it has to change because remember I'm changing the physical length of the line and the physical length of the line is going to have more and more loss as I create a longer line and that means that the loss will change but of course the center frequency of the filter will not shift so just to do this experiment you can see how easy it is to use this instrument and get the, the kind of uh, data that you want out of it very easily and uh, quite fast and responsive again I have no problem with it for to two thousand dollars that this thing cost and you get a lot for your money so I'm pretty happy with that so let's go ahead and do a different experiment and let's try the distance to failure measurement and uh, that can be done also it's a similar to a return loss measurement but we can find out if a cable is broken and at what point in the length of the cable the fault occurs and here is our setup for the distance to failure measurement so here I have an SMA cable it has two connectors on it and it terminated into 50 ohms and now you can imagine this cable being buried underground or somewhere inaccessible and there's a fault that happens in it you just don't know where that fault is obviously you don't want to dig all of it out you want to find out exactly where to go to look for the fault so this distance to failure measurement is a very common measurement on portable spectrum uh, portable network analyzers so we're going to try it out on this unit now this is perfectly matched to 50 ohms so it doesn't really matter the carrier frequency that I use for this experiment but normally you would set the carrier frequency to match your antenna so for example if I was using it with this antenna I would set the carrier frequency I would do my calibration on the instrument at the carrier uh, frequency of this antenna so that I can get a, a reasonable a meaningful measurement otherwise the measurement would be quite bad so anyway so right now at three and a half gigahertz we have everything set up so we can zoom into the screen of the unit and see what it is reporting so right now the cable is good so it shouldn't be reporting any, any faults and indeed we can see that it is not reporting anything uh, the screen shows that the signal is sitting at the floor of the uh, instruments uh, level there at minus 40 dB you can see a tiny little peak there and a tiny little peak there those peaks actually do correspond to the connectors in the cables and when you assemble cables together those connectors are never perfect transition uh, between the two cables so there's going to be some impedance variation between the two cables and that interface is going to create reflections and because if you have a sufficient large dynamic range you will see those connectors in there but a fault an actual open or a short will be a much bigger uh, signal so then you can detect that much easier so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just break the cable somewhere in the middle I, I happen to know that I'm going to break it at a four meter mark and let's see if we can see the failure show up at four meters so I'm going to go and disconnect that there we go and there it is you can see that the, the point where the connector was now picked up much much higher and that's because the cable is now open at that point so I can move this over 
uh, right to the peak of that and check it out you can see exactly four meters and this is the advantage of having phase information so that when you get you get the reflection back you can tell exactly where the uh, the fault is so now I can go ahead and fix the fault and you can see that point will go back and there it is and it disappears almost into the noise floor and I can create a fault somewhere further down the cable I'm going to remove the load so the cable will, is going to be a little bit longer before the fault and <laughs> there it is there's a new peak right there that is our fault right there and we can go ahead and go and right on top of it there it is and indeed we can see that it is sitting at five meters now you can also change the amplitude uh, put a little bit more signal into it I believe you can go no I take that back I thought you could go more than zero dB you cannot never mind so it's zero dBm is the maximum uh, power you can put out anyway so you can see that indeed it works quite well you can detect the fault very easily and if I were to put the load back I will correct the uh, the problem and it will disappear so and this again is, is a very basic function of network analyzer but they've made it very nice and easy on this unit to be able to quickly do this measurement and I think it's uh, quite nice and you can change some other uh, aspects of it you can change the K factor you can change the format anyway I'm not going to go into the details of that I just wanted to give you an idea that indeed uh, you can do these measurements very easily now there's a couple of things that we still have to look at and we haven't looked at the oh that's not what I wanted to do we haven't looked at the some of the functionality we've done S11 we've done uh, distance to failure S21 uh, we haven't looked at the spectrum and we haven't looked at the RF source and AF source and there's also a field one which you can go and look up it, it can, you can measure field strength of signal and interferences coming in it's basically similar to the spectrum analysis but I'm going to just do the spectrum analyzer a demo here for you guys so you can get an idea of what's going on with it and that, that should uh, give you a good impression of how well this unit works uh, let's go ahead and try the spectrum analyzer Alright, in order to test the spectrum analyzer as well as the uh, waveform generator functions of the VNA, I'm going to use the Azure and EXA for generating a signal and the Azure and EXA for monitoring the signal coming from the instrument. So first let's start creating uh, some signal from the EXA or EXG directly and in fact right now I'm uh, creating a 1 gigahertz signal with a 0 dBm output and I'm putting that into the unit. And I've already configured this instrument into a spectrum analyzer mode and I want to show you some of its limitations and some of the things you need to watch out for uh, when using it in this uh, in this mode. So let me get this uh, screen uh, centered here. Here we go. So right now we're in spectrum analyzer mode and it's running and the output of the synthesizer is actually enabled but you don't see anything and the reason for that is because we just don't happen to land in one of the frequency bins which this thing can measure. Remember this has a hard filter on the IF. If you don't fall within that filter then you will not see the frequency of interest. Now this is jumping uh, at certain frequency ranges and it doesn't have a tunable filter, it doesn't have any of the traditional spectrum analyzer components. We're using the network analyzer functionality to look at the spectrum. This limitation is due to that. But nonetheless you can still look at the spectrum if you're careful. So right now if you look at it just like this you will say well there is no signal. Actually there is and the problem is that if you look here we have, if I go under function you can see we have 900 points and if I go back to uh, here over here you can see I'm starting from 100 megahertz to 4.5 gigahertz and the steps are 4.89 megahertz and that does not land on a 1 gigahertz tone therefore we will not see it. It doesn't matter if I change the resolution bandwidth the highest resolution bandwidth this, can, this thing can show me is 30 kilohertz and if I change the resolution bandwidth what I can do is I can lower the noise floor as to be expected this is uh, uh, just a displayed average noise floor can keep going down uh, but let's just keep it at 30 kilohertz for our purposes so we don't see anything but if I go and change the start frequency to zero where then the steps actually do land on one gigahertz there is our signal so you have to really watch out for this otherwise you're going to get totally the wrong result in thinking that there is no signal now there's a couple of other things you need to take into account I see three tones here let's forget about the DC tone that's that's nothing it doesn't matter that's the DC offset on the signal pad all spectrum analyzers do that so you can see that I have the fundamental tone at 1 gigahertz at minus 1.5 dBm. There's some loss in the cable and so on, so that's correct. And then the second harmonic at 2 gigahertz is 44 dBm. And minus 44 dBm is a 42, 43 dB down. And that's, that's normal. This is the roughly the total harmonic distortion that I expect to, to see. Sorry about the clicking noise that's coming from the EXA while it's booting and aligning. But I also see another tone here. 
Now that tone is actually the image uh, caused by the internal down conversion of the VNA. And in order for you to know if that's real, if it's part of your signal or it's not, what they have implemented here is that they allow you to switch the allow mode from a low to a high allow, meaning that you can shift it to the upper sideband or to the lower sideband by having the allow be above the RF or below the RF. This, this will then shift the image by the second IF value. And if it shifts, it means it's not real. And if it doesn't shift, it means it's real. So I can go ahead and change that. Right now the allow mode is set to high. You can see high allow. I can change it to low allow. You can see that one of the tones jumps back and forth and it jumps by exactly the, uh, the s by the amount of the second IF, that means that tone isn't actually there. And that's in fact true, that tone should not be there. This is the Agilent EXG, it's an extremely clean synthesizer, it doesn't have that harmonic there. So this is a way for you to uh, recognize and find out if you have that tone actually there or not. So this is a pretty handy thing that they have given you because they recognize that you are using this not really the way it's intended to be used, but you still can get something out of it. And this is why they have implemented this. So I'm pretty happy with that. Again, keep in mind that you do have the limitations and so on. Everything else is like a regular spectrum analyzer. You just have to keep this one little point in mind. If I change the start frequency to something else, the signals will all completely disappear because they just simply will not be sampled by the ADC. So there's a uh, quick look at that. I can also create a multi-tone and we can see what that looks like. So I have now configured the EXG to generate eight different tones uh, separated by 10 megahertz each. And let's see what it looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. There we go. And you can see that obviously we're going to get a, a from the display a thicker uh, portion there because there's many, many tones close to each other. And let's go ahead and change the frequency span and see if we can capture those tones. And it's gonna be quite difficult, but let's see what happens. Uh, on the start, let's try from, let's say 950 megahertz and you can see all the tones now disappear and we're going to stop at 10 50 megahertz there we go there's our tones uh, so we can capture them so indeed it is uh, working it's quite nice you can see a uh, nicely evenly spaced tones there are no extra harmonics in there and uh, this is very good because this instrument exg is such a good source i can go ahead and change the number of tones again so let's go ahead and try um, uh, instead of eight tones, we can do 16 tones. And we can uh, change the frequency spacing from eight megahertz to four megahertz and 16 tones and random. There we go, done and apply. And there is our other tones. There it is. You can see that it works quite nicely. So if, you, if you're looking close enough, you will be able to catch your tones. You just have to be careful when you're really far away. Uh, you, will, you will be able to easily miss the tones uh, that are in the signal. So it looks, looks good. works quite nicely. And the only other thing left to do is to see how well it generates a tone by looking at the tone on our spectrum analyzer. Now there is one other little thing that I, I want you to keep in mind. Right now the instrument is in spectrum analyzer mode just like before and I'm going to look at the screen of my EXA and if you take a look you can see that in spectrum analyzer mode there isn't in sufficient isolation from the port uh, port one of the instrument and it's actually outputting some tones out of the instrument. Now this is typically not a problem uh, but if you have a very sensitive device you're trying to measure you may create additional harmonics by mixing these within the harmonic within the product terms of the circuit you're trying to measure so you have to be a little bit cautious. These are pretty small tones they're all below minus 40 dBm just keep that in mind if you're measuring something really sensitive. For all practical purposes, it doesn't really matter. Just keep that in mind. It, it may be uh, an issue at some point. All right, let's change the mode. So we go from mode to go to RF source. And here we are in RF source again, so we can just enter the simple frequency settings that we want to output from the port right now. Uh, port 2 so is selected, so let's change it to port 1. And the frequency is set to 1 gigahertz. The amplitude is set to 0 dBm and there is no modulation is turned off. Now, there is no on and off indicator, so you don't know when the RF port is on and off by anything other than that little tiny symbol at the very top there. So if I press the stop and run, the same symbol they use for the sweep, they also use for turning on and off the output. So uh, just as long as you know that, you can look for it. So let's go ahead and look at the spectrum analyzer right over here. Let me get this thing to focus. There we go, and let's see how good it looks. I'm gonna go ahead and enable it. And there it is, look at it. So 
you obviously get a lot of tones because it's not properly filtered, so you're not going to have a great total harmonic distortion, but it is not that bad. There's a little bit of activity here below minus 50 dBm, and it could be coming from the synthesizer. I'm not sure. I have to look exactly and see how they're configuring the synthesizer for it to create those tones there. Maybe some dividers are you know, generating signals and it doesn't have proper isolation. But other than that, it looks you know, fairly clean. It's not that bad. And we can change the frequency, and indeed it has full coverage. So 1.1, 1 .1, 2, 3, I can keep going all the way to, this is 3.5 gigahertz now. And now we are at 5 gigahertz, and I can go all the way to 7 gigahertz. And at 7 gigahertz, the maximum amount of power that it's guaranteed to put out is minus 11 dBm. And there's some extra loss here uh, in the cables there. So I can do a peak search over here. You can see that minus 15 dBm, about 4 dB loss in the cable. Eh, maybe a little bit of loss there for sure. So it, you know, it works reasonably fine. I have no problem with it. Let's set it back to 1 gigahertz, and let's take a close look at the signal and see how it is. I mean, change the amplitude uh, back to 0 dBm. It also, by the way, goes all the way to 10 dBm at lower frequencies. I'm sorry, at 3 dBm. It goes to 3 dBm at a, a gigahertz. So let's set it to 0. I'm fine with that. And let's take a close look at it. So frequency, center frequency, we go 1 gigahertz. Let's reduce the span to, let's say, 5 megahertz and resolution bandwidth a little bit lower. Yeah, nice and clean, a very low phase noise. Again, the synthesizer, the analog device synthesizer, is supposed to be quite low phase noise, reasonable. Um, so let me go to a peak search over here. You can see, indeed, it's sitting at a gigahertz, and the amplitude is about 0 dBm. Uh, let's try something higher, and i show you something that I've observed. So frequency, let's go to, let's say, 3.5 gigahertz. 3.5 gigahertz. I'm going to set the center frequency here to 3.5 gigahertz. And take a look. It has some, uh, some spurs uh, that come and go. It's not quite uh, stable. The center frequency seems to be pretty stable. But in order to really understand what's going on here, you have to look at this on a real-time spectrum analyzer. And I don't have that set up here right now, but I do have the Tetectronics one, obviously, a very good one. And uh, I don't have the B version of this, which has the real-time spectrum analyzer, the MXA, which I reviewed before. Yeah, so there's something going on at higher frequencies. Uh, the synthesizer is probably not configured correctly, so it doesn't produce a very stable tone there. You can see uh, some spurs come and go. Now, for network anal analysis, is probably not a big issue. If, it, if they're all doing that, they're correlated, it doesn't really matter. But you don't want this. You want to have a clean signal. And I think that this might be something that they can uh, fix with firmware. Oh, wait. Now this is aligning. It's going to take a while. But anyway, it's just got an idea of what's going on there and I'm hoping that once they watch this um, and they will figure out how to fix it and provide a firmware update uh, to get rid of that. But other than that, you know, it uh, works reasonably well. So I'm just going to wait until this alignment is done so I can show you uh, the modulation capability as well. All right, so let's go back to 1 gigahertz because of this because of this instability here, I can't really demonstrate that very well. So let's go 1 gigahertz and we're going to go a center frequency of 1 gigahertz. I'm going to reduce the span a lot to, let's say, um, 100 kilohertz. I'm going to reduce the resolution bandwidth significantly. And I'm going to turn on uh, some ASK modulation. So this is capable of doing ASK modulation directly on the signal. And uh, we can go all the way to a modulation depth of 90%. So that's what I'm set to. And it can go all the way up to a modulation frequency of 3 kilohertz. So let's go ahead and give it a try. There it is. So we got ASK, amplitude shift keying, and it's doing, uh, I believe, just on and off, basically. And uh, yeah, we can see all the tones that are a result of that. It's a very classic uh, tone distribution for an ASK modulation. And we can increase that, and you can see the, the skirts and so on. Yeah, lo works quite nicely. You can see all the other harmonics are quite quite a bit lower. It's actually quite clean. It's very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on at the higher frequencies. I'm sure they will fix that. So yeah, there you go. I mean, uh, there is a lot more, obviously, I can talk about. It's a, a pretty interesting and reasonably priced instrument considering what you can uh, do with it and what you can get from it. Uh, I, there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't really show you. I haven't shown you in the, uh, the, the low frequency output. In fact, if you go on to the mode and you go to 
AF source, there you have even more modulation capabilities. So you can either do ASK, FM, PM, uh, so you can have more modulation capabilities that's built into that analog device as I see, which I've talked about before. So this is a really nice feature because you're basically getting a low frequency um, synthesizer also uh, that comes with all the way from very, very low frequencies. So yeah, a lot of functionality. There's a couple of other modes that I didn't really talk about uh, in detail. I didn't talk about the field, in, in which case you can get signal strengths directly coming in. You can put your antenna gain in there and then you can find out exactly how much interference signal is coming. You can actually compute antenna gain from that as well. So yeah, pretty powerful unit uh, for the price, it's about $2,000. A couple of little shortcomings there, but uh, pretty good, I would say, uh, considering what you get again from it, you, ha you have to always put the, the amount of money versus what you're getting. And I don't, I'm not aware of any other instrument as capable as this within this price range. So I'm pretty happy to have this in the lab and for future experiments, especially because you can give us S parameters. There you go, it's just, just running out of battery now. It's been on for many, many hours. So indeed it meets his, uh, uh, the time that they report. So I, I've had this on for quite, quite some time now. So yeah, it looks pretty good. I hope you enjoyed this review. Again, as always, uh, the best way to help me is either through Patreon or by letting the vendors know that you watch my reviews, especially uh, Keysai, Tektron, um, Keith Lee, those guys, I do quite a bit of reviews for them and these reviews take a very long time to prepare so I hope that you enjoy them. Well, I couldn't resist and I assembled the other one and yes, it does turn on and yes, it seems like it's working. I haven't done extensive tests on it to see uh, you know, exactly if it's fully functional and it's up to spec or not, but it is up and running. Unfortunately, I have a couple of extra screws left. I didn't, I must have missed it somewhere, so I, I don't have time really to take it apart again. So I thought what I'll do is I'll give this away to one of the Patreon supporters of my channel. So I'll send you the <laughs> extra screws also, and I'm hoping that you would take it apart, take a look inside, uh, figure out what's going on in it, find where the screws are supposed to go, and just understand its operation, and hopefully it will be up and running, and that you can use it also. And remember, this will not have the manufacturer's warranty. It's basically a parts unit, but I'm pretty sure anybody who's following this channel would love to take one of these apart and take a look at what's going on. And if it works, which I think it does, uh, you're gonna have your own little network analyzer. So I'm gonna go on Patreon and grab a list of all the people who are supporting me and just pick one randomly, um, you know, with a random number generator, and I'll send it to you guys and hope that uh, you will enjoy it. And this is the first thing that I'm giving to my Patreon supporters. I have given other equipment away, but this is uniquely for my uh, Patreon supporters. I have another really exciting instrument that I'm also giving away to my Patreon supporters. That one's uh, pretty exciting. Coming up soon once I finish reviewing it. So look out for that as well. And I hope you enjoyed this review. I'll see you soon.